Uh, well, welcome to our session about the next billion users, Wikipedia on mobile. Uh, the format of this is slightly different than what you might have seen on the Wikimania website or uh, in the program. Uh, so basically the next 75 or 80 minutes uh, will look like this. Uh, my name is Amit Kapoor. I'm going to speak for 25 minutes about our mobile partnership strategy, uh, how it works, and some examples and data for what we've seen so far. Uh, following that, Thomas Fink, who if you were in the last session you saw him speak, uh, is going to talk about the implementation and user experience of these programs. Uh, and then we're going to do a Q&A panel discussion for 30 minutes, uh, including Cool Wadwa, who many of you know, uh, Dan Foy, who's our technical partner manager, and we actually have two guests today from our partners. We have Phil from Orange and Martin from Telenor. So you can ask them any questions uh, about their involvement in these partnerships and what they believe uh, the role of mobile access is in reaching the rest of the world. Uh, for the Q&A, we've opened up an etherpad. If you want to ask questions, you can also raise your hand and ask them, but I'll give you a minute to uh, enter this into your browser, throw some questions on there. Uh, I'll check it. I'll help moderate the discussion, uh, but we want it to be very open, and uh, we wanted to give you the chance to ask questions anonymously if you wanted to, so that's why we've opened up the etherpad. Has anyone not gotten the address that needs it? Nope. Okay, well, let's tell our story. So uh, I don't really need to tell this crowd, but the world is essentially not divided equally. We have uh, about 75% of the world's population living where about 30% uh, of the money is. So you have five and a half billion people in developing countries, which only has 30% of the entire world's GDP. So what this essentially means is that where people live, there is not really the technology, infrastructure, and frankly, there's just not the means. Um, so, in this gap between developing countries and developed countries, and sorry, if I go up here and clarify, blue countries equals developing, gray, developed. So the gap between developing countries and developed countries has always been huge from a technology and infrastructure standpoint. If you look back at the advent of communications, uh, per telephone lines, you would have about 50 for every 100 people in developed countries and a little more than 10 in developing countries. So there's always been a very, very big communications and infrastructure gap. When the internet came around, we like to think of the internet as democratizing access and media, but this gap never closed. The gap between who had broadband access in developed countries and who has it in developing countries uh, is still quite huge. What we've seen now with mobile phones, though, is for the first time we've seen a reduction in this gap, to where it's truly, in the developing world, almost every single person has a mobile subscription. In developing countries, it's actually not much, much less. So for the first time, we've seen the absence and we've seen a closing of this gap. Uh, and when we talk about percentages, so if you have eight mobile phones for every 10 people in developing countries, what that actually means in numbers is it means that you have over 5 billion mobile subscribers uh, in the developing world, which essentially means there's almost one mobile subscription for every single person in the world. So why does that matter to us? Why does that gap mean anything to everybody in this room, to the Wikimedia movement? Uh, well, it's basically in our mission. It's everywhere we see it. We use the words, imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. So I underlined every single person on the planet because that's what we talk about. But frankly, when we're strictly an internet desktop enabled website, it doesn't really mean every single person on the planet. Uh, and this is a goal of ours. We're very public about it. In the strategic plan that was, that was released in 2010, we said very publicly, we want to reach 1 billion people by 2015. So that means essentially we have three years to reach a billion people. Uh, and guess what? We're only halfway there. So as of May, our reach of unique visitors for Wikipedia, this is our best estimate from our Comscore data, is about 480 million. So we essentially need to double that. So what we believe is that we can close this gap through mobile, through the, the lack of a gap that I showed you before will actually allow us to close our access gap. Uh, but in order to bridge these gaps, we need to address, address barriers. And we know that there are barriers. So if you look on the left, the world of communications looks like what I just showed you. There's a lot more people in developing countries than in developed countries. But if you look at Wikipedia page views, it starts to resemble what we saw before in fixed landlines, fixed uh, broadband, is that we have a skew. Essentially, 
we're getting page views where the money is, but we want to essentially get page views and access where the people are. But to do that, we need to address the barriers. Why do these gaps exist? And how do we know that they're barriers? There's statistics all over the place, but here's one. So in 2011, 85% of every phone sold in the world had some form of internet browser. But today, only 15% of people in the world have any access to the mobile web. So 15% sounds like a lot, or sounds like very little, but think about this. So if you think, look at some countries in Africa, I'm just gonna say Egypt, for example. There's statistics that show that 70% of people that access the mobile web in Egypt, that is their primary or only access to the internet. So what this means is that of that 15%, once that goes up, that's gonna to start to cover the entire world. But there is a gap. There is a gap right now. And why, uh, what is the gap? Well, one reason is it's still pretty expensive to get on the mobile internet for a lot of people. So this is an example of the cost of data in India. Uh, it costs 10 pice, which is uh, a tenth of a rupee for 10 kilobytes of mobile data. I took this directly from an Indian operator site uh, earlier today. Uh, your average Wikipedia article is 200 kilobytes. So you do math and it essentially costs four, uh, it costs two rupees or about four cents to read one Wikipedia article. In any given month, our data tells us that the average person reads about 20 articles. So what that means is 80 cents a month on average for data to access Wikipedia. So that doesn't seem like a lot because less than a dollar is probably not that big of a deal to a lot of us. But when you consider this relative to income, uh, 80 cents to access Wikipedia for one month in India, the average income, so there's a, there's a statistic called gross national income per capita. So average income in India is $105 a month. So that means your average person to read Wikipedia for one month in India will spend two days of wages just on data access. Uh, if, that, if, if 80 cents still doesn't sound like enough when I say two days, so if we change these numbers out and if we figure what income is in the US, what income is in Germany, that would essentially mean you on your mobile phone would spend up to 372 US dollars if you were American or lived in the US, or you'd spend, if you were German, for example, you'd spend 250 euros a month just to access Wikipedia on your phone. Uh, there's other statistics that show if you look at, uh, let's say, in the country of Bangladesh, and you look at the, the lower quintile, which is the poorest 20% of people, they will spend up to 25 or 30% of their entire income just on mobile services because it's become such a necessary means and such a staple of life. Uh, but that's only part of the barrier. So cost, it's very expensive. Cost is a barrier. The second barrier we have, though, is delivery. So when I talked before about four and a half billion mobile subscribers in the world, when we talk about cost and mobile internet, even if we address those people that cannot afford it, we still are only really looking at about 800 million people. And that's a lot of people, and that's something we can reach uh, quite soon and quite uh, quickly if we do it intelligently, we believe. But there's also 3.7 billion people that have fairly basic phones, that their phone has no modern uh, mobile browser at all. So this is what we're calling a delivery barrier. When I talked about the cost of data, that was a cost barrier. And then for 3.7 billion people, we have a delivery barrier. But there's good news when I think about, when we talk about the delivery barrier. Uh, most people know how to use a text message. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you guys know how to use a text message to text your friends or text your coworkers, or whatever it might be. Uh, right now, there are three times as many people in the world that use SMS than use email. Uh, that is an astounding statistic. So no, more people know how to actually type on a phone than they do necessarily to type on a keyboard. Uh, so that's the first bit of good news when it comes to delivery. The second, good, the second bit of good news is when I look at that number of 3.7 billion people, uh, a lot of these people have pretty much the exact same phone that runs on the same platform. So about 700 million of these have a Nokia S40 device, which for those of you that, um, that don't live in the US, you probably know how uh, popular and ubiquitous Nokia phones are. But there's about 700 million of them that run on the Nokia S40 platform. So let's review all these facts before I get into the partnerships. Fact number one, mobile devices are the first technology to represent almost every single human being on the planet. Number two, we are Wikimedia. We want to share knowledge with every single human being on the planet. We said one billion by 2015, that means we need to reach 500 million more over the next three years. 
Third fact, there's 4.5 billion mobile subscriptions in the developing world, but there are barriers to accessing knowledge. We believe that around 800, up to 800 million people might have a cost barrier, and up to 3.7 billion have a delivery barrier. So what are we doing about it? We've come up with mobile partnership programs to directly address these barriers uh, to reach our metrics and hit every single person on the planet. So to address the cost barrier, we have a program called Wikipedia Zero, which is what a lot of you have probably heard about. There's been some of it in the press, and we talk about it quite a bit. Um, we also have delivery programs, which you guys might not know about because they're actually not rolled out yet, but they're very deeply in development. Uh, this is Wikipedia by SMS and USSD, and also a Wikipedia J2ME app, which addresses the Nokia S40 uh, group that I talked about. Uh, so uh, a question we get a lot is, why does a foundation do this? Why, you know, we're, we're a very uh, community and ground up oriented organization. So why is the foundation involved? And why is the foundation partnering with people in order to do this? Um, the, the fact is, is that the uh, simpler that somebody's device is, the more difficult that access is, uh, the more help you essentially need. So that's the more that we're dependent on infrastructure, that we're dependent on businesses, and frankly, uh, we're dependent on subsidies and things um, like scholarships. So th the further we move up this line into the developing world, into the broader section of people that have barriers to access, the more involvement we need directly at the foundation level, at a global level, and that we need to enlist partners to help us. So let's first talk about delivery programs. Uh, these are the two that I referenced, Wikipedia by SMS USSD and Wikipedia by J2ME app. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this because Thomas, who's going to present next, is going to talk quite a bit about these. Um, but just to give you a broad overview of what these are, so uh, a lot of you might not know what USSD is. Frankly, I didn't really know a year ago. Uh, it stands for Unstructured Supplementary Data. A very simple way to think about it is it's basically uh, where SMS meets IM. So it's quick back and forth SMS on your phone to send text back and forth with a gateway. Uh, so what this means, along with the SMS program, is that you can read a Wikipedia article by text. So if you can envision, I'm going to send a text to uh, a certain number, and the text is going to say uh, Washington, DC, and then uh, the Wikipedia article would come back to you bifurcated in several messages where you can get top level information and you can answer questions without a browser. Uh, so how are we going to do this? We're going to implement it through carrier partnerships uh, because mobile operators essentially have these gateways which operate SMS and USSD and give us access to all of these people. Uh, we're going to do this along with Wikipedia Zero partnerships, meaning the same operators that we partner with for Wikipedia Zero we want to partner with on SMS and USSD. Uh, our goal is to make it as free or as cheap as possible, free where we can. Other times, we're going to work to make sure that uh, the carrier operator partner pretty much prices it at cost, um, because there is a lot of variable cost. It can be expensive to do. Uh, but our goal is to make it as accessible as possible. We obviously are not going to commercialize it. This is not a means to make money uh, or fundraise. Uh, the partners will help us in marketing usage, so people know that it's there and know how to use it. Uh, and we're going to test this in India and or Africa starting in Q3 or Q4. Uh, like I said, Thomas is going to talk about this experience and implementation a lot more next. Uh, the second delivery program will be a J2ME app, which will work for those 700 million people that have a Nokia S40. Uh, and this is just like the smartphone app, the iPhone app, or the Android app that you might have, but it's a much simpler text, uh, much simpler reading, reading version for these simple mobile browsers. Uh, we aim to launch this in Q4, and again, we're going to use our carrier partners to help uh, distribute this. Uh, but now I want to spend the rest of the time, the next 10 minutes or so, talking about uh, the cost barrier and what we're doing about it. So Wikipedia Zero is the program that we have to address very directly the cost barrier. I have a Wikipedia Zero sticker here. Uh, if any of you guys do not, we will be handing them out afterwards. Cool has a big role there, um, and we can... We can give you guys extra. We'll leave some at the merchandise table. But um, uh, we'd love it if you showed your support, took a sticker, put it wherever you like. Um, uh, so uh, what is Wikipedia Zero? It's no data charges for accessing Wikipedia. So it's really free access to the sum of all human knowledge. What does it mean? What does zero mean? Zero means zero data charges to access a version of Wikipedia. I'll explain what version means. 
uh, coming up. But essentially, zero cost to the end user. So if you can picture going to Wikipedia on your phone, for a lot of people, the meter is running when you do that. Every 10 kilobytes, every 250 megabytes that you accrue is charging you. When you are a, Wikip when you're a customer of a Wikipedia Zero partner, you get charged nothing. Uh, it is essentially a truly, truly free service. Uh, anyone with a SIM card of a partner uh, will have access to Wikipedia Zero. There's no, there'll be no limits on how much you can read, and even if you do not have a data plan on your phone, you will be able to access Wikipedia on your phone. So what does this achieve? Uh, three things. Most importantly, like I said, eliminates cost as a barrier to seeking free knowledge. Uh, secondly, uh, it'll introduce a lot of people to Wikipedia for the first time via the marketing that the partners will do to publicly get the word out. Uh, and third, it reaches our target, those whose primary or only access to the internet uh, is via a mobile device. So it's going to get us closer and closer to every single human being on the planet. Uh, how does Wikipedia Zero work? Very, very easy. If you're a customer of a partner, you turn on your phone browser, and then you go to the Wikipedia URL. Uh, Wikipedia URLs, essentially, with Wikipedia Zero, will have two versions. There's two different URLs. Uh, the first is m.wikipedia.org, which is the site, the mobile front end that you always go to on your phone, even if you don't realize it. That's what you've been going to uh, on your phone. The second version that we are releasing as part of this program is at the URL 0.wikipedia.org. Uh, and this is just like the mobile site, but is text only. So images are one layer behind. Uh, the reason for this site is a couple of reasons. One, um, it addresses those with slower connections in 2G rural areas. Uh, and secondly, for carrier partners that have a concern uh, about uh, bandwidth and um, cost, it's essentially a less costly, less strenuous way to offer a version of Wikipedia. Uh, so these two versions of Wikipedia, I want to give a quick preview because it can be confusing to some people. Uh, so in, for many partners through Wikipedia Zero, m.wikipedia.org will be free. So this means if you go to Wikipedia on your mobile phone, whether you go there directly or via Google, it is free. Uh, the second version is zero.wikipedia.org, in which you must go specifically to this URL uh, in order to get free access to Wikipedia. With both of these, if you click on an external link, in the case of m.wikipedia, or if you click on an image link within zero.wikipedia, uh, you receive a quick message warning you that you may incur data charges. Uh, and then if you click yes or no, you either go back to the article or you advance to the external page or the image page on Commons. Uh, for m.wikipedia, you do not get charged for the image page on Commons. For zero.wikipedia, you would. Uh, so partners uh, that we work with will either offer both of these versions or some that are concerned um, about strain on the network or cost will just be zero.wikipedia.org. But over the course of the next year, we want to move more and more to offer both. So how do we make it happen? Uh, well, first and foremost, we negotiate with carrier partners. Uh, we, again, we have two of them here that you can talk to and ask all the questions you want today. But we focus on priority countries and we look at mission aligned companies. Who are the companies that, A, are willing to take this pretty big risk and essentially give away a lot of money, but we also want to make sure that the mission and the hearts of these companies are in tune with the Wikimedia mission. Uh, we look for maximum impact. We're a pretty small team, so we look to do multi-country deals where we can reach a lot of users, a lot of countries, a lot of cultures in one deal. Uh, so why does a partner do it? If you're a partner that makes money off of mobile data, uh, why would you essentially give so much of it away? Um, they do it, one, because they support the mission. Again, we look for mission-aligned companies to do this with. Uh, secondly, there is a practical benefit as a business for them. It introduces new people to the usefulness of the mobile internet. So Wikipedia Zero users today are likely smartphone users a couple of years from now. So it's introducing people to uh, really the internet the same way that we were probably introduced to it 15 years ago. Uh, finally, it's attractive to customers. It's a good selling point. People will choose one carrier over another if one of them has free Wikipedia and the other does not. Um, and then once we've signed these deals, which is frankly a, a pretty long, arduous, lots of paperwork, lots of selling processes, but we get to implementation. So we work uh, with the carrier's billing system to where they can do what's called zero rating the data so they can identify when people go to Wikipedia that it is indeed free. Uh, and then we implement features based on the carrier's IP range. Uh, so what are the features of Wikipedia Zero? I will take you through a couple of those right now. 
Uh, we will add a notification on top of Wikipedia Zero Pages so users know that it's free. Uh, we've actually already done this in the countries in which we've launched. But essentially, if you're on your mobile site and you are a customer, there will be a notification that this Wikipedia access is free and sponsored by the carrier partner. In this case, it is Orange. Um, the language of that notification will change with the language of the wiki. So if you're on Arabic wiki, this notice will be in Arabic. Uh, this message is collapsible, so you can click it away. It'll be gone for 24 hours, and then will show up if you come back the next day. Uh, and it's only visible to people on the partner's network. So you're only seeing this banner if it is indeed free for you. Uh, the second feature that we're launching, which is sort of a kill two birds with one stone, is we're actually uh, doing a specialized front page for Wikipedia Zero. So depending on the partner, if you go to m.wikipedia and or zero.wikipedia.org, we're putting a new front page for Wikipedia Zero. And what this is, so this, is this will have language selection to the most popular languages in the country. Uh, why is this important? Um, because basically as more and more people uh, have access to internet for the first time, these people are less and less likely to speak English, more and more likely to speak native languages, um, and currently, right now, we don't have language redirection on Wikipedia Mobile. So this example shows you a partner in Malaysia. So if you uh, go to zero.wikipedia through this Malaysian partner, you have the option at the very front to search in English or go to the Malaysian homepage, the Mandarin homepage, or the Indonesian homepage. Uh, another interesting statistic of why this is very important is all of the growth that we're seeing through a lot of these non-core languages. If you take Indonesian, for example, all of the growth in Indonesian Wikipedia page views over the last year has been on mobile. Growth is something like 500% or 1,000% on mobile page views uh, through mobile Wikipedia for Indonesian to where it's mostly flat on desktop. Uh, the second thing we're doing as far as addressing these barriers is we're addressing the speed barrier. So by making zero.wikipedia.org available to customers on this partner network, we're essentially addressing those people that, have, that are concerned that the reason they don't use Wikipedia on their phone is not just cost, but also because it loads way too slow. Uh, our research team did a reader survey last year, and essentially they said, what's the number one reason why you don't use Wikipedia on their phone? Uh, and the number one thing that came back was people said, well, it's just too slow, and I don't have the patience. Uh, so where is Wikipedia Zero today? So today we've announced two principal partners, which actually, I say two partners, but it's actually 28 partners, because it's two uh, core companies that cover 28 different countries and carriers, which means that 205 million people, if they have a capable phone, would have access. Uh, and then four of these 28 countries have launched to date. So our two partners that we've announced are Orange, which is going to launch in all of these countries. Uh, I've put an asterisk by those places that have launched. And then our second partner is Telenor, which will launch in all of these countries. And again, we have Martin and Phil from Orange and Telenor today to uh, answer your questions on the panel. Uh, this is just some press and coverage we got when we announced the Orange partnership, which was our first one in January. Uh, there's another one from Engadget. I just think that picture's funny. <laughs> Uh, and then this is some press that we got from the Telenor announcement. The Daily Star is a newspaper in Bangladesh, and then there was also an event in Norway with Jimmy and the Crown Prince, uh, which essentially celebrated this partnership. Uh, uh, so where will Wikipedia Zero be in a year? Uh, I promise you there will be more announcements very, very soon. Uh, we're going to continue to enlist partners in developing countries. Send us your leads if you know people, if you know executives at these companies. Uh, we're going to emphasize priority areas uh, where we have catalyst projects and where we have a lot of work going on. This includes India, Middle East, and the Bra Brazil. Uh, so it's 205 million today, people today that can potentially have access. We want that to be over 500 million a year from now. Uh, this is a map of the world that shows you where we're targeting, where we're going to have agreed to launch, and where we've already launched. Uh, so with these partnerships, how do we actually get people to use Wikipedia Zero? Uh, here's an example of the marketing that I was talking about, which is essentially through our partners, and even though Wikipedia is free, you still have to let people know what it is and how, uh, how they can access it and essentially communicate very, very briefly, very succinctly, what is free knowledge. So through this, we're going to do a lot of partner marketing uh, with, with these companies. Uh, this is an example from Kampala, Uganda. Uh, so this is a poster that's on the side of a bus stop. There's over 100 of these uh, throughout Uganda right now. So if you can imagine um, 
somebody who has never used Wikipedia before might be at a bus stop. They may not have a data plan, but they can actually turn on their phone browser. For the first time, they might be on a mobile internet site, and that site will be Wikipedia. And they can conduct their first search, look up something that they have never been able to look up before, because they probably don't have a computer at home. They probably don't have easy access to books, libraries, et cetera. Uh, and so that's a marketing challenge for us, is how do you get someone to make that first search? And that's what we're going to address through marketing with our partners. Uh, more examples of this, we're also encouraging very basic messaging, not just big posters on bus stops. This is an example from our partner in Malaysia. Uh, Digi is an affiliate of Telenor. Uh, so this is a mailer that they did that essentially this is in people's mailboxes. It's an advertisement for their network, but it's essentially saying, hey, if you get a phone and activate a phone, use it to access Wikipedia for free. Uh, and then there's very, very basic web promotion um, on uh, partner social media sites, on their websites. This obviously is not going to hit the, uh, the long tail of, rule of, of new mobile users because uh, it's very desktop oriented, but it's still an additional way to get people uh, to use the service and gets the word out. Uh, and then finally, we're going to advocate strongly for direct links. So there's probably no easier way uh, once you make something free is to give somebody a quick and easy button to access it. So we're working with our partners to try to get prominent placement on their devices, on their portals, and all these areas that they own to direct traffic for people to search for free knowledge, often for the first time. Uh, so what more will be done to promote Wikipedia Zero over the next year? Uh, we're going to do more PR, as we saw. We're going to try to do some events on the ground um, to try to attract uh, some local attention. We're going to do some marketing experiments with our partners, convincing them to spend some of their marketing budgets uh, to actually promote Wikipedia to a lot of these people for the first time. Uh, all of you guys that are, are in the community that know these, especially if you're from these countries or if you know these countries well, uh, we want your suggestions. So come talk to me afterwards or send us an email. We would really would like to know what you think would be most effective in any of these countries that we're going to be launching. Uh, and then finally, how will we measure it? Um, we are working very, very uh, hardly, very toughly on analytics to try to measure what the actual impact of Wikipedia Zero is. Uh, the, best way know, the best way we know to do this, uh, which trust me is extremely, extremely difficult, uh, but we're still working on it, is to measure page views from partners. Um, so we're setting up the infrastructure and the reporting system to do that. Um, we uh, are still working with it, but we do have some preliminary data. We've only been launched for two months uh, in, in Uganda and Tunisia, and we just launched a month ago in Malaysia and a few weeks ago in Niger. Uh, but what we've seen in two months of data, this is for all page views from this partner, uh, is we essentially see, um, we're seeing a growth. So in Uganda, we've seen about 20% growth in all page views from uh, the partner's IP ranges. In Tunisia, we've seen over 45%. Um, so again, over time, we're going to see, uh, hopefully this will continue to expand. But even so, they're pretty good indicators so far. Uh, the red line in this is a control country. I think this is Cameroon. It's a country that we've tracked data for, but we haven't yet launched. So this shows you what is organic growth versus what is possibly growth because Wikipedia is free. Uh, and then there's the one billion question. So I talked about page views, but we want to actually measure uh, how many people we're reaching. So this is something that we need to address over the next year is through Wikipedia Zero, through SMS and USSD, we need to be able to actually measure not just page views, but the number of people. So this is a problem that we've got to tackle soon. Uh, so over the next year of Wikipedia Zero, we're going to launch new countries, all the ones that I showed you. We're going to enlist more partners, and we're going to optimize marketing and outreach. And that's where a lot of my time will be spent over the next year, as well as Cool and Dan, uh, who you'll get to meet on the panel soon if you haven't met. Uh, so what's in store for the future? Uh, so we would like to get the community more involved uh, in this project. I think one good way to do that will be that if you're in these countries to help us with testing. Uh, so reach out to Dan, or Dan can come reach out to you and how you can help us do this. Um, we're curious and, and come talk to us. This can be a panel question or afterwards. If you're really interested uh, in helping on kind of the marketing side of it, um, we can maybe start a mailing list, have these discussions uh, on wikis, but we really want your local knowledge to help us with these projects. Uh, we're going to talk with device makers, hopefully Samsung and Nokia, to figure out how we can uh, work more closely with them and uh, reach lots and lots of people at once um, with these types of programs. Uh, we're going to look. Uh, possibly next year at uh, voice response. So saying, uh, doing a query by voice and getting an article spoken back to you. Uh, this is something we want to experiment with. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And we essentially want to get to a billion people. Uh, and that's our goal, to reach every single human being on the planet with these programs. Uh, so a reminder, ask your questions on the Etherpad. And I'll be back up here for the panel. 
in a little bit, but uh, I'll turn it over to Thomas, who will talk about technology and implementation. Alrighty, hello everybody. For those that joined me on my previous talk about our mobile projects, thank you for sticking with us. For those that, that are new, welcome. Um, as Amit said, I'm going to be focusing on the technical aspects of the Zero projects and a number of other initiatives that we have for reaching the next billion users in the world. Um, I'll do a quick recap for anybody who's new to the room about what is really important when it comes to this range of projects. So, as Amit did, I want to start out with, with this quote. Imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we're doing. Or at least, that's what we say we're doing. That's what we aim for. But what's happening right now is that we have qualifiers. We're saying that, well, you can have that if you can pay for data connection, or if you have a modern phone, or if you have a data-capable phone. And that's bad, right? Because We'd like to reach as many peoples as possible, but there are some clear obstacles from the people that honestly need it the most. And we can't have that. As Amit pointed out, we need to get rid of these obstacles. We need to be able to push past them. And we truly need to get to a point where every single person has access to this information. And while it's important to hit some of the new fancy Android, iOS, and modern devices, we have billions upon billions of devices that are already distributed within the world that can't access the projects. And early on when we were talking about these projects, I was calling them alternate access projects. And after discussing it with many, many people, I realized that, you know what? All of these projects are on SMS, Wikipedia Zero, J2ME. They're not really alternate forms of access. What we do here, using our modern smartphones on high data connections, that's really the alternate form of access across mobile devices. These new older technologies, that's the primary way that people access information. And if we can't deliver Wikipedia over these primary means, then we're missing the mark. And we're missing the mark about connecting and really providing the sum of all human knowledge to every single person. So how are we going to tackle them? Um, I already talked a lot about zero, so I'll, I'll move pretty quickly through these slides. Um, of course, trying to remedy data connections, zero. I'm going to show one side of it looks like. Here's another capture of it on Android-based phones. We see that we have banners running on, on the experience. It's really important for us to be able to identify th that the user is in a zero-like experience. Um, one of the things that we've heard from a number of people that are using zero products, zero-like products, is that it is imperative for them to have some kind of notification that they are in a zero workflow. They are really conscious about their data use, and we would never want a case where somebody is uh, using their data connection on a provider that they think is zero-rated, or maybe it's one that they've thought about from a friend, and they end up getting charged for it. Being able to notify them and really prove to them that, yes, you're on a zero connection is really, really important. But overall, how does the Wikipedia experience change with Zero? Not much. Ahmed already showcased the main page, configurable languages. Images are not displayed. We show in interstitials. It is a much smoother, much faster experience. But overall, in terms of the content, in terms of the access to information, not much changes. So how does it work? Well, here's a really high level architecture of what happens when somebody wants to access a zero-based website of ours. We have the user on the left. They have their phone. They connect to zero.wikipedia.org. They connect through, through their carrier, who passes on that information, and they hit our caching cluster. Now, our, our caching cluster is smart. It is pre-configured to know that there are special connections that come through from specific carriers. Those are the IP ranges that Amit was talking about earlier. And when it realizes that somebody is coming in from a specific IP range, well, we tag that packet. We say, OK, this is different than the rest. This is different than our normal traffic. And we append to it. We pass it through our cluster. It gets down to the MediaWiki Zero extension. And then we inspect that packet again and say, oh, this is one of these special connections. This is one that is through Zero. And we say, OK, we need to figure out how we have this particular infrastructure configured. And that's when we take a look at which carrier it is and what particular configuration that um, carrier has. And in order for, to provide you the detail on that, 
I'd like to ask Dan to come up and tell you about what it's like to actually connect a carrier to the Wikimedia technical infrastructure. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Dan Foy. I'm uh, essentially the technical contact for our uh, for our carriers to discuss uh, how to do how to do the, get this stuff set up. So, so essentially, there's three stages here. For one, it's uh, exchanging information about uh, the information that they need from us to know what uh, URLs to whitelist to make sure that the fees are not charged for, at least the page is not charged for, and also um, we gather information in terms of what uh, their configuration needs are, uh, any wording changes, the, the language list, uh, how that's set up, and um, but most importantly, the IP ranges that we can identify uh, their traffic so that we can, like Thomas was saying, mark, uh, mark up their pages with this configuration because uh, our servers need to be able to identify uh, if this particular request is coming from just a regular mobile phone or um, partner, uh, any number of uh, partners and, and treat it correctly. So uh, the next thing is uh, is conducting a live test, and this is kind of a unique thing with uh, our website, and that is the testing uh, changes its behavior based on the IP range. So really, to do a full test, it can really only be done uh, from the originating IP in another country, usually uh, in the other side of the world. So what we have to do is uh, turn this on for about an hour and coordinating with our operator. The operator will go through and run through a checklist of tests and verify that this is all working correctly and get back to us with anything that came up that they uh, need some work on. So, and since this is something that we're just in the process of launching where we've been working out issues and we've been expanding some of the scope and so there's been some back and forth on this, uh, but it's getting much simpler. And so that's really kind of the, the diagnostics is a part of my role is to go in and answer all the questions possible, uh, fix as much as possible, uh, to keep the engineers who are working on the back end of this uh, as offloaded as we can since we have very limited resources. And uh, so once we can co conduct these tests, and the partner is satisfied that everything is working, then we just arrange the right time to turn it on for the marketing, and then we launch it. So that's it. Yeah. All right. So that's Wikipedia Zero. I put up the project page for it uh, from the technical perspective up there. If you'd like to get involved as a developer or just want to stay up to date with our tests, um, we're actually going to start using our Twitter handle to broadcast when we have new tests coming up and we're really eager for volunteers to be able to get involved because we need your help to be able to test this as an effective product and we won't be able to do it w without you guys involved. So that's zero. It addresses that first point of we can't pay for a data connection. Second point, modern smartphone. If you take a look at the range of phones that are out within the world right, right now, it, it's pretty broad. The, the most common kind of phone th that you find out there is an S40 phone. It looks like this. It's Symbian based. S40s, S60s fall into that device class. And there are billions of these out in the world right now. They have been used for the last 10 years. And even though they're getting phased out from popular use, their install base is still gigantic. It's huge. And when it comes to reaching the people that we need most, these are the phones that we find in our studies, our statistics, that show up more than anything else. And currently, there are some devices that work well, but not all of them. So when I mentioned that there were two device classes, S40 and S60, think of those as slightly different versions of the operating system. I'm generalizing, but that's effectively what it is. When we take a look at an S40, well, this is what one of the devices looks like. And there's a huge range within the S40 device class. There are some newer S40s that have modern browsers that can access Wikipedia Zero, but there are, there are a lot of really old devices that 
don't have a modern WebKit-enabled browser, that don't have enough of the infrastructure to really be able to load the web page, to load Wikipedia, and that's bad, right? We want to be able to reach these people, but now we have a technical obstacle. Not a fin financial, but a technical obstacle here. So, how are we going to resolve that? Well, we've been working with a company called OpenPath, which has been doing J2ME JT, development for quite a while. And we've been working really closely with them to figure out how can we build an application experience that somebody who has one of these older phones can really benefit from all of this content without having to worry whether their web browser supports it or not. And we've gotten to the point where we have a really, really early version of the application. Here's some screenshots from it. You can see that we have Wikipedia loading up there on the left side. We have featured articles. And on the right side, you can see an article detail page. You see that on these, we have far less screen real estate than ever before. Really old S40 devices can be as small as, oh, I think it was 96 by 70-ish. Really tiny devices. And we really have to rethink about what the layout will look like on these devices. So we have to simplify as much as possible. But that doesn't mean that we want to compromise on the amount of content that we can really show people. So we're really trying to be able to have as much feature parity between the Android and iOS applications that we talked about earlier and having them in this app as well. As you can see, we have a lot of the same pieces that you've seen before. Safe pages, inner wiki links, search suggestions, and more importantly, this one is API driven so that as we modernize our infrastructure, it won't be as brittle of an experience. Here's a very quick high level view of the workflow. You can see that there are a number of components of the application. This of course was an early mockup and we're moving through different iterations of it, but I just wanted to highlight two specific sections of this particular workflow. Featured articles, main pages, I, they'll be the same as you've been used to them on our Android apps, our mobile web experience. We want to bring the same experience to our J2Me devices. You can see that we feature in the news, search, and really whatever content that you as a community have chosen to show up on your main page, well, we want to be able to surface that as well within the application. We also want to be able to have safe pages within the application. It was really important for us to get them within the Android application, but it's even more important to have them in the J2ME app. The amount of connectivity and the amount of consistent connectivity that people will have that use J2ME enabled phones is pretty sporadic. Um, having used them myself in various places over the world, having some amount of offline capabilities is critical, and it's very much a requirement for these users. So being able to mimic that, mimic that functionality is really important. When we start looking at articles, being able to mimic a simple and efficient interface with collapsible sections, as you've seen on the site, is also a key component. So just as, as you've seen with our other applications, we're going to try to make a similar experience happen here. Oh, I'll just skip past that one. So, if you're interested about the project, there's the project page. Um, I do have an early alpha build of it. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the demo right now. But if you're curious about it, I, I can pull it up on this laptop and show you what it's like. And I can even mail you a copy of it if you have a J2ME enabled S40 phone so that you can be one of our early alpha testers. I'd love to hear feedback from you. So, we hit data connections. We hit modern phones. But as Ahmed said, that's still not good enough. That's still allowing for a huge portion of the world not to be able to have any access to Wikipedia whatsoever. And the way that we're going to reach the rest of people is looking at SMS and USSD. Both of these technologies are critical to be able to reach as many people as we need to reach with our mission. And I'm happy to say that we have a development project that is meant to address that. We've been working with a nonprofit called the Precult Foundation from South Africa. The Precult Foundation is a health organization that does open source development and has used SMS and USSD aggressively to be able to connect with a lot of their health initiatives. We're really lucky to be able to have people who are as experienced as they are to help us move this forward. And as part of their delivery mechanism, they've built an application called Vumi. And that's, and that's an open source application that we're now configuring within our infrastructure and really building as the SMS and USSDA experience. 
So I think a lot of people here are familiar with SMS. Amit talked a little bit about USSD, but I'm just gonna throw a couple more bullet points for anybody who is not familiar with USSD and why it's really important. So in order to start a conversation over USSD, you have to put in a command. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit cryptic and they can be, well, it, they'll, they'll depend per carrier. So each carrier makes up their own shortcode for communicating with the service. One of the key things to think about when it comes to USSD is that it's very menu based. If you've ever done any kind of bill pay on your phone, you're likely communicating over USSD. And you can navigate through it and then you can get content back in SMS. But the biggest portion that's really important is that it requires no data whatsoever. It goes over a unbilled um, infrastructure and then depending on how you get the content back, it'll typically come over SMS. But honestly, even more important than that, you don't have to install anything. If you have a phone, a GSM based phone, you all, your phone likely already has the ability to use USSD. There's no app to install. You can start to use it as soon as you have a carrier shortcode. And that's huge because for a lot of the people that we want to reach here, installing anything on an S40 is just not going to happen. Or a much earlier phone. If you have an old candy bar phone, you can't install anything on it. So to have a service that works is really, really important. Quick overview on, on Boomi. This is a pretty high level. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk about it in more depth. But the important thing to think about it is that there are various ways of connecting with Vumi. You can use SMS, USSD, Jabber, Twitter. Think of it as a big messaging engine that has a lot of, in, uh, a lot of inputs. We then connect it with the Wikipedia-based application. We pull from our API, and everything comes back. And you know, architecture is fun to look at, but let's take a little screen. Let's take a look at what this interaction actually looks like. So here you see a screenshot of. Um, us interacting with Vumi. So we started off a conversation there and said, okay, I'd like to search for the term Saturn. And you can see that it gives us back a menu of a number of different articles that start with that text. We refine it and pick number one, and then it gives us the article subsections so that we can further drill down to just the exact content that we want. One of the things that we want to be careful about is that if this is a customer who is using SMS for delivery and doesn't have or doesn't have free uh, or cheap SMS messages, we don't want to bombard them with too much article content. We want to be very careful about how much we deliver to them. So it's really important to subselect as much as possible. So there you can see that we've picked the physical characteristics section and it showed them a little preview over USSD and then the rest would get delivered over SMS. And this is an early workflow. We're still experimenting with it aggressively, but it gives you a general idea of what the SMS and USSD experience would be like. Here's a second one, searching for the term Mars. Yet again, searching for the term, drilling down, getting the content. If this is a project that you're interested in, I highly recommend looking at the project page for it, but something that's even better is that it's up right now. It's very early, it's very experimental, but if you have a Jabber-based client, which if, if you're on Gmail or Gtalk, um, you'll have access to, send a message to wikipediavumitest at gmail.com, and it'll respond back and function in the same way that you've just seen in these slides. So we're working on it aggressively, so if you see it going up and down, that's what happens. But as we always like to do, we want to get it in front of you guys as quickly as possible, so you can tell us what's working, what's not, and tell us how to make it better. And if you're a developer, there's the GitHub link for the application that we've developed as well that works right alongside Vumi to connect to Wikipedia. So re recapping, three big points that we looked at was how do we remove the fact that people have connections that are too expensive, modern phones, and uh, oops, looks, yeah, and don't, don't have a data connection. Well, we're addressing them with three very specific tools, looking at Xero, looking at the J2ME-based app, and then also looking at SMS and USSD with Vumi so that even if you have these technical hurdles, we have solutions for you. We're building them out, and we're really excited to be able to deploy them and connect with the next billion users that really can benefit most from this information. So I'd like to open it up here for any questions that you guys might have.
Uh, just what comes to mind, first of all, is uh, uh, is this going to be available for all Wikipedia or all Wikimedia Foundation projects like mm -hmm. Wikinews, Wiktionary? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, so great question there. Initially, we're going to be doing a pilot with Wikipedia to see how well it works. That's going to teach us a lot about what the infrastructure is like, what it's like to interact with the content. After we see what that's like, we'll figure out the next steps. Certainly from a technology standpoint, we, we definitely have ideas about how to integrate with it, but we want to do this as a pilot with Wikipedia first to see if it even makes sense. We think it does. We'd like to see it go further, but we want to experiment with Wikipedia first. Have you done user tests yet? On User-centered design, uh, user design tests, mm -hmm. testing so that people can figure out how to get through the menus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're in the very early stages of that. So I'd love to run you through the application and get some feedback. We're also leaning a lot on our partners who have done this many, many of times in the past and learning from them to find out what works best and what doesn't. They're all in early stages now, so we're actively testing. Okay, just one last question. Mm -hmm. Facebook mm -hmm. is also interested in reaching mm -hmm. those one billion people, mm -hmm. right? And you showed a picture of the phone with a Facebook app mm -hmm. on it, on that old mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're doing it already, right? Mm -hmm. What, what are the similarities or differences between your project and their project? Sure. And what are the differences in their strategies? Sure, sure. So uh, I may not be the best person to talk about the strategy, but in terms of the application itself, as you saw it installed on that phone, when we have a J2ME application available, we should be able to have it on the person's de desktop so that it's ready and in front of them. Um, Cool and Amit may be able to speak more so about carriers that we're working with and having that app pre-installed on phones, because that's something that we really want to be, be able to do. Cool. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, what about uh, localized font rendering problems uh, in the intermediate layers of such fonts? Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. they don't have, like a S40, cannot uh, render the local font, how do we overcome that barrier? Yeah, there's definitely a huge amount of technical hurdles that we have when it comes to internationalization, and we're just beginning to test and see what happens there. So that, that is for experimentation right now. I don't have, I don't yet know which ones will work or will not. It's going to take testing with our community and figuring out which are the most important ones to, to, to get to work. So we're trying to be aggressive with, with, about which countries these are going to get launched in and making sure that those languages work and keep adding them on as we go. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna stop on questions here so that we can get the panel to come up and then we can continue them on from there. All right, thank you everybody. Um, so all, all the questions, all, those, all, these, all of you that still had your hands up, so this, this is the team to answer those questions uh, in addition to, to Thomas. Um, so everyone wanna quick, say a quick hello and just say who you are? Yeah, uh, I'm Dan Foy. Uh, Mic, contact for, uh, okay, microphone. Yeah, I'm Dan Foy. I'm the uh, technical manager for our partner operations. Hi, I'm uh, Philip Steinmetz from Orange Group uh, Marketing. I actually came as a neighbor because I work in New York City. Uh, I do business intelligence there. We don't have any consumer activity in the U.S., as you may know. Uh, but I, I work with the people uh, in France that did work on the implementation for uh, Africa and uh, Middle East. Martin Warzo, I'm doing business development for the Telenor Group. Um, yeah. Um, I'm Cool Wadawa. Um, I was actually um, kind of initiated this program even over like two years ago when I had colleagues at Facebook and they were talking about Facebook zero rating, um, you know, their application so they would allow for more access to people and then finally, you know, pushing this internally and working at the tech team. So this is kind of, I've been heading this program and, you know, trying to build a team around it because we really believe that we want to drop as many barriers as possible so everyone around the world can have access to Wikipedia. Uh, so we'll open it up to questions, and then we have some on the Etherpad as well. Oh, do you want me to use this space? It's probably here without the microphone. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Rex, and my question is actually on the Etherpad, but I thought I might as well ask it anyway. Um, when we were doing Monmouthpedia, we found that we could use QR codes, which were scanned, to get people to a URL, but the QRpedia URL that we used, the server detected the phone's language. And that enabled us to know which Wikipedia 
to direct the people to. Have you any way of incorporating that sort of technology into your scheme so that if somebody's in mm, South Africa and they have an Afrikaans enabled phone, then when they, they, they look for a particular thing, it would actually take them to the item in, in Afrikaans if it exists or a Google translation of the, the English one if not. Sure. So, I mean, in terms of, of geodetection, we can certainly do that. Um, I, I'm starting a conversation with the uh, developers of the application just to better understand what the use cases are. Um, I think that some of that may be possible, but we'll have to test and see where it fits best. Yeah, and also to that issue, I mean, we probably would have to start out just kind of looking at that just from, like, the general mobile experience. Um, when you apply that to zero, like, some of the issues we have to work with um, when we're dealing with carriers, you know, they, we have to kind of, you know, analyze their billing systems, for example. And some of them can only take, like, whitelist up to eight URLs before it becomes a problem. So we have to, like, look at the possible languages first. So, like, if somebody was on a language that wasn't whitelisted, that could be problematic. Um, you know, we're a little bit different. This is how we are different, like, in Facebook. We have, you know, hundreds of subdomains, right, because every possible language is subdomain. So we basically have to go in and make sure all of those are whitelisted. And, you know, a lot of these cares and we're in developing countries aren't, their systems aren't really built for that yet. But you're going to have to do that if you're going to reach every Yes. Human yes. But, I mean, we have to also work with our partners to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so right. whitelisting. So basically, if you go to, um, you know, like Wikipedia, the site, that you're not going to be paid. Like, the carrier basically will make sure that you're not billed for it. So when they whitelist it, basically, you know, gives you free access to it. So you've spoken a lot about getting more people access to Wikipedia to find information. But I'm sure there's billions of people know a lot of things that are not currently on Wikipedia. Have you thought about ways to allow them to edit things through a, an older mobile phone? <laughs> so the question was about how we can get people who have the technologies that we've talked about here contributing. And that's important. That's definitely something that we want to take a look at. And it's something that I see on the horizon. I think the first pass, we need to see which communication technologies we've talked about here work to actually reach these people. After we know the fact that the, the J2ME app does really well, well, we can iterate on that. And we can figure out, all right, contributions there. We can think about what's best. And there's a number of different things that, that we can think about. But if it ends up that SMS and USSD is more important, then we should spend our resources there. As a small organization, we can't attack everything. We have to be very strategic. So until we know which delivery mechanism is giving us the broadest reach, we are going to pause on thinking about contributory features. Once we know which one works well, then we'll iterate on the features and we'll think about what to add next. Hi, I have a question about uh, the USSD SMS solution. Since the articles could be big um, and they will come in multi-part SMS, are you doing something on the devices to um, assemble them and present them as a one big article for my user experience? Uh, yes, we, we will be sending out the articles. Uh, it, it's always carrier dependent when it comes to SMS and USSD. Uh, but very often, a lot of phones have the capability of, of having a multi-message SMS that actually on the phone will concatenate them together about se about around seven messages as tends to be the limit. And so that's around three or four sentences of an article. And at that point, they can get this, they can get this block and they can, they can decide whether to continue reading the next several se okay. sections. So this way they're not, if they hit something they didn't want, they're not going to be swamped, we know, with, you know, 400 SMS messages on a very long article. And for the countries you're targeting and the carriers that are in the plan, how many offer free SMSs? So a big article could really cost the user a lot of money. And, and that would be their only way to get Wikimedia. <laughs> is there another solution beyond that? Like if SMS is costly, then what? I think when we're talking about the Zero Project, it is all about uh, providing them a delivery mechanism that is for no cost. I think. If there's any more to that, Amit, do you have anything else? Yeah. So actually, at this moment, like in developing countries, um, no one's really offering it for free, like that's SMS what I USSD. Thought, I yeah. mean, that's that's the big issue because it's you know um, I don't know if you guys want to actually 
add a little bit um, of your input here, but you know, for carers in developing countries, it's pretty much a cash cow SMS. But the costs are starting to come down. Like we've actually had discussions where it would be, you know, included in package. Maybe there'd be some free messages to kind of start them out. Um, but it's something that's in discussion. We're trying to keep moving them to offer more and more, possibly for or, free. Or maybe instead of uh, per SMS, it could be per article because of the... Yes, that's actually what we're doing right now. So we're going to do a pilot next month in India. So we're actually, um, Dan's working on the project plan for that. And we're hoping to scale this out worldwide. But, um, you know, with that market, we basically have convinced them to bring it to the, like the lowest possible cost. And then it would be like per article. So basically it would be next to nothing. And most of the people that we're going to try it out with, first of all, already have existing packages. So it's not going to be an additional cost to them. But our biggest push is to keep dropping that price down to zero. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to complement on that, uh, in the countries where Orange operates in Africa, so it's over 20 countries in Africa and Middle East, uh, between 7 and 15% of, of phones are actually capable of ac accessing the mobile internet, so that's not much. So we're definitely very willing to uh, look forward for the, for the USSD uh, solution with uh, Wikipedia and we'll probably look at uh, all the terrification for that, that kind of solution. And when you mentioned the IVR, I also think it's a very good solution because we, we've seen in Africa that they, they use, I mean, we implement IVR solutions for other types of content like soccer uh, results or so soccer you know, uh, scores uh, or um, music even, you know, to, get to, to, to listen to music via IVR when you have a phone that is, of course, not capable of playing music, uh, especially streaming music. Uh, so I think it's, it's potentially a very good solution. Also, it would uh, help uh, address uh, illiterate people, you know, and that, that would also be big. Just to add to that, I mean, we've, you know, especially like we're, with, we're here with Orange and Telnor representatives, and they've been very cooperative. Like, they really, like, when we talk to people at Orange, we also deal with people at the foundation, and they're very concerned also about education as well. So, like, they're doing all they can to kind of, you know, make an exception for free knowledge. They don't consider us in the same vein as, like, Facebook or Twitter. They're trying to run their own zero programs. But, you know, if someone brought up Facebook, those are usually limited to, like, you know, three to six months, and same with Twitter. And these are kind of very long-term deals, and they're looking at trying to eliminate all the cost barriers with us. So they also believe in the importance. And, you know, when they also talk about, like, IVR for voice, I mean, you know, we're trying to reach people that also are illiterate. And this is going to be primarily in languages that are not in English. You know, so there's a lot of testing and cooperation that we need from them. And they've really been, you know, doing everything they can to make sure that we could reduce those barriers with them. Are there barriers that we are creating as content creators uh, on Wikipedia that will make it more difficult to be able to produce the Wikipedia Zero pro uh, product? Uh, I'm thinking like templates and Wikidata and stuff like that. Right. So um, not necessarily maybe those issues, but this is pretty interesting. I guess I'll take this because I've been you know talking to a lot of people about the user experience. And if you're editors and you're thinking about like how do we kind of think about Wikipedia a little bit different, and the probably the biggest uh, feedback that we've been getting, especially people from developing countries, is that they'd like to see summaries of like articles. Like you know it's too long to go through all of these. Some of some people you know it takes them a lot longer to read in a mobile device and, you know, when they're kind of on the go. And that's not something that we can do from a technical perspective. It's really kind of a, it's a community issue. Like, you know, do we actually start thinking about, you know, as a Wikipedia community to kind of look at articles and rewrite summaries for those? So people that are, you know, in these countries, they can look at articles quickly, they can get through them easily, and then figure out if they want to read further on a mobile device. That is kind of by far and away, you know, the most feedback we get because they want to have like smaller chunks of information. And, you know, when you are on a mobile device, that experience is completely different than if you're on a laptop or a desktop or even a tablet, you know. So that's kind of thing. It's like how do they consume that content and be able to access it in a way that's more um, amenable to somebody on a mobile device. And, I, you know, in some ways that's not that different from people in the in developed world as well. Uh, I I, I would guess that you could add that um, the text has to speak for itself. You, you, you don't have to be depending on pictures 
video clips, complicated graphics, because it's not going to show, right? So how you thought of this possibility? Very much related to the same question. How you thought of this possibility of every article, the current article, to have a subversion, uh, you know, like like another version that the editors can edit and keep it for Wikipedia Zero? That would be interesting, but that would have to be kind of community driven. We don't have a tech technical solution because for that. It will be very, um, you know, the smart engine cannot do that. Yeah. You'll, you'll need some human community intelligence. Yes, yeah, so it has to be very like it's, it has to be community driven. So that maybe should that be a topic for next year? Is like how do we start rethinking about even you know, you know, around the content projects? How do we think about you know delivering content or creating it that's more amenable to people that are using it on mobile devices? You know, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, the, I mean, there is simple English, but you know, that's that. Those are really different articles in a lot of way. I mean, they're written differently. I mean, the originally, I mean, it was supposed to be also, you know, good for kids. It's not necessarily the case, but um, that's not exactly what you know the, they're looking for in terms of feedback. We even, I know there were some um, projects also with the Indian community where they're like, hey, can we start out, you know, looking at simple Wikipedia and starting from there? I don't know how those discussions have gone so far, but. Um, it's interesting to kind of look at this from more of like a content perspective and how it translates to different devices. But I, I think it's something we should bring up at like a, in a further date. Can I? Um, one of the things that occurred to me when you were talking about IVR is that on our normal desktop based Wikipedia, people can use a, a screen reader if they're visually impaired. Um, to give some semblance of the same experience. And it just occurred to me that on mobile, uh, you're not going to have a, a screen reader that's going to work, as far as I know. Um, those kind of apps don't exist. Uh, on the other hand, you have actually got a, a, an audio mechanism built into the phone. Right. Have you looked at the ways in which you're going to deal? Because if we're going to get every single human being, yeah. I promise you there's some of them are going to be visually impaired and only have access on a mobile phone. So there's a little bit of technology there to look at. Thank you. And, and illiterate, oh, please. So I'll, I'll just start off. That's ag actually we're starting to look at that right now. So most of the carriers that we've talked to actually have experience in IVR. And some even like when we talk to carriers in India, they've, they've done it in English, Hindi, and Tamil. So they're, they, they have experience. The, the problem is, is that you know, a Wikipedia article, nothing to that extent before. Usually it would be kind of like a weather report or you know, a cricket score or something to that extent. But we know the technology is there. And we're going to do an evaluation within the next month to see what development we have to do on our mobile API to be able to deliver you know, content and be a voice. But it's definitely on our roadmap right now. And hopefully by the next time we do this, we will have you know, a lot of information and results from that. Um, maybe you, yeah, maybe you guys, I don't know if you guys have, you know, have any direct experience with that, because I know that, you know, Orange has talked about, like, some IVR trials that you were doing. I don't, I don't know technically. Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty new, right, in terms of the way they're rolling it out, but we definitely were interested in it. So that is on our roadmap. So after we do our USSD and SMS pilots, because, you know, it's kind of the same, it's somewhat sim similar delivery format, we're going to, you know, try out voice as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so, does anybody else have questions from the audience? Otherwise, we can go to the Etherpad questions. I think there's one in the back. Hi. I'm just wondering if um, you guys have some apps about um, how to bring some content of the academia about science and physics into the mobile so uh, the less fortunate people around, let's say, in Africa or so, they can have um, a chance to get to learn from that. Thank you. Um. We, we are just going to, to use Wikipedia together with a project we're doing in Bangladesh, uh, where we're actually going out to schools to kind of digitally educate kids and at the same time introducing them to possible sources to academic knowledge uh, on the internet. 
So I think where we can contribute is actually to, to make the resources available, and then I guess uh, Wikimedia can contribute with the content. Yeah, and also, I mean, not just the delivery itself, but like we're actually working with our partners here, and you know, Amit's been doing a lot of work around that in terms of all, all the marketing, like messaging. People don't realize that actually, um, not even just billboards, but the way to reach a lot of people so they're aware of what's going on is radio. Um, we're working even on radio campaigns. Um, we started one out in Uganda, obviously, and we want to message as much as possible that you can access you know, science and information. And we're going to hopefully coordinate with some of our education programs as well. So people know that now, you know, and I'll tell you this really interesting story, like why a lot of us were kind of interested. Like even one of some of the um, Indian community, um, they talked about how they kind of got together and pitched in their money so they could look up Wikipedia articles on a mobile device. You know, they didn't have enough money, they pitched in so they can look up like science articles before one of their exams. So I mean, if we're doing, you know, some marketing campaigns with our partners, we're working with the education um, team, and then they're going into universities, and they know that now they can access it for free. If they want to look up things, you know, especially what's around the science and technology, then, you know, we're pretty much creating a new e ecosystem where people feel like, okay, now they have access to this, it leads to education, people, you know, um, institutions around that are helping deliver it actually are supporting that as well. So we're trying to build that whole, um, like I said, ecosystem so everybody's involved with it. And, you know, if you have any suggestions, please, you know, email us, you know, um, let us know what, you know, what we could be doing better. Hi, um, it's Isla from Africa, uh, from Wiki Africa again, and um, it's a comment really, not rather a question. I just wanted to thank you, uh, the two mobile operators for getting involved in this because um, <laughs> it might seem logical now, but it hasn't been a logical leap really. And um, I also just wanted to say that. Um, at the moment, you guys have the monopoly, but I think it would be really, really amazing when um, the others are intimidated and and become desire, you know, want to compete. So I'm looking forward to the MTNs and the Vodacoms and the Vodafones also getting involved. Okay, thanks. I, I think they will copy us, and and I think it will be a very general movement because uh, because first of all, we do communicate on it as as you've seen. Uh, with the Uganda and Tunisia campaigns, uh, and second of all, we think it is a differentiator, and and we we uh, we think they'll be jealous of it, and also uh, Africa is really a world where you know more than 80, 95 percent of people are on prepaid, and 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 you know there is no there's not really loyalty or stickiness, and uh, and it's very easy to change operator. And they all actually have several SIMs from several operators and they switch back and forth depending of, on promotions they can get. So if we can, uh, as an operator, keep them on our service because we deliver more and we give them access to things that they don't have access to otherwise uh, for free, uh, we believe it's a good uh, proposition and a good benefit for them and for us in, in the long run. I guess I should thank uh, Wikimedia as well for having the courage to work with us. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say credit to you know the two partners that are sitting up here from Orange and Telenor. Um, like we've had lots of discussions with different carriers, and they were like bold enough to go first on these. And also they've like we've had lots of discussions. I made very clear to them we don't do anything exclusive. Like our goal is to get everybody access. And they know that we're talking to their competitors and they're, we're going to get them on board as well and we're going to have lots of news coming out. And the great thing is they understand that that's what we have to do. Like they're not forcing us to be exclusive with them. Um, they actually just made the first leap and they know that we'll eventually be working with their partners because otherwise we're not going to be reaching everybody. And they, they understand that's our mission. You know, so you know, that's you know, an additional point where we, sh we should really be thankful that they understand that. Uh, okay, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. There was one question on the Etherpad, uh, which I can answer. It's, it's basically if, how do I get my local carrier on Wikipedia Zero or on one of these programs? Uh, and the simple answer is just email Cool and I, um, and we will, we will uh, track them down and see what we can do.
Seriously, you just email anybody at the foundation or whatever at all. <laughs> Tweet us, I don't care, whatever you want to do, you can pretty much find us. You know, we're not that big, so. Yeah, email him. Email these guys. Say, hey, you want to work with your competitors? Con connect us to these guys. I'm sure they will. So, um, And if you have not gotten a Wikipedia Zero sticker, we have English and Arabic available. So come down and get, uh, get some stickers. Uh, all right. So thank you guys very much for coming.